Hello, everybody. This is NGO Soul and Strategy. Today, I am going to talk with John, John Hecklinger. I hope I pronounced that name right. You'll tell me in a moment, John. He is the CEO of the Global Fund for Children, and we are going to talk about trust-based philanthropy. We're going to talk about um, hashtag shift to power and many more things. John and I met about a year ago, and what was striking about that initial conversation to me was how determined but also self-aware John was about how he, but most importantly, Global Fund for Children, seemed to be about being on a path towards what some people call shifting power, and his thoughts about how philanthropy needs to change in order to, quote unquote, decolonize were also of interest to me, since I'm always on the lookout for organizations that try to put their money where their mouth is. So I decided to ask John some more in this interview. So John, very welcome to you. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for asking me, Tosca. It's going to be a good conversation for sure. John is the president and CEO of the Global Fund for Children. He also is a co-chair of the was I think I should say, for the Alliance for International Youth Development. He was also, and this we will uh, circle back to, the chief program officer at Global Giving. Uh, worked in another role there in business development as well. And worked also in the private sector, interestingly enough, as a director of data acquisition and started out in the Peace Corps in the U.S. volunteer mm -hmm. program. John, an obvious first question. Tell us a little bit about the nature of the Global Fund for Children. Yeah, I mean, the Global Fund for Children, we we occupy a really kind of interesting, unique you know, space in the whole kind of philanthropy and global development ecosystem. Um, you can think about us as a bit of um, an intermediary, um, and I say that very self-consciously because <laughs> I think in this uh, era where we're actually trying to, you know, shift the way things are done, not everybody is ready to do that themselves all the time, um, and so they need help. And so, what what Global Fund for Children does is we. Um, find these amazing you know grassroots organizations all over the world working with children and youth and increasingly led by by youth um and we provide uh uh you know multiple years of flexible support paired with highly tailored you know kind of capacity development uh services um we also and this has been a new uh practice of ours in the last several of several years we you know gather organizations together and launch them as uh, cohorts. And so when they're mm. you know together in a particular geographic area working on a particular problem, you know we assemble organizations that are tackling different aspects of that challenge that have the you know desire to uh, work with others and learn with others and be more powerful uh, together and. We typically will have uh, a staff member uh, who's also, you know, from that region and you know, deeply involved in um, addressing the issues that the cohort is 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 also addressing, you know, to really accompany, you know, the cohort and become, uh, when it works well, almost a uh, a virtual member of their organizations. Um, so very very deeply involved, um, developing a lot of trust. Uh, with those organizations. Um, and I think we've experienced uh, some nice growth over the past few years. I think because uh, funders um, and most of our funding comes from uh, family foundations, uh, corporate foundations, larger private foundations, you know, they're sensing that, hey, the way we've been operating isn't you know, really living up to our aspirations. We want to be more community led um but we are not staffed or geared up to do that so by working with us providing the funding through global fund for children that ultimately supports that you know flexible funding for uh you know truly grassroots organizations yeah you know, we can be 
you know, an intermediary, not just of the funding to move money from point A to point B, although that is a very useful function that other organizations do, um, but we're an intermediary of, of trust and of knowledge, and we can kind of transform what for us is um, more restricted funding coming from a more traditional foundation, but magically transforming that into more flexible funding <laughs> for organizations on the ground and then taking on the responsibility of, you know, rolling all the interesting things that happen up into, you know, reports you know, to that funder. So we have the possibility of, you know, really working closely with, you know, the organizations we support, you know, to put in, you know, reporting and, and learning practices that are actually meaningful to them. And then rolling that into a, a report that also satisfies a donor, which, you know, may have more specific, you know, requirements that uh, that they, um, yeah, they want to have fulfilled, you know, by their grantees. Um, and so that's that's the, the 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 top line description of of the the spot we uh, we occupy in the ecosystem. I'm going to immediately diverge from what I thought I was going to ask you by first <laughs> asking you, you used the word intermediary right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of the irony is, but I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I know you're going to explain this to us, is that, as you know, the, the role of being an intermediary for, for what I call a Global North founded NGO is has been questioned more and more for the last 10 years at least, right? And yet the way you framed it, Global Fund for Children is a very useful intermediary. That then, it, any more comments on that would be welcome. But also, I was interested to hear how you said you're, you are, um, if I understood it right, the foundations that give to you as an intermediary, quote unquote, allow you to make their potentially more rigid requirements more flexible. Why do they, why are they willing to do that with you? And how do you make that trans translation, if you will? Mm -hmm. I mean, the most important thing is that um, everybody's interests are aligned, you know, from the organizations that we pull together into these cohorts to uh, our ability to actually, you know, engage authentically with those organizations and also the aim you know, of, you know, the funder. So if the funder, say, is interested um, in, um, let's say, you know, the, one of our biggest programs is, you know, funded by Lego Foundation. It's a partnership to educate all kids. So it's, you know, for younger kids, organizations all over the world, um, uh, no surprise, you know, uh, working on, you know, learning through through play of various, various types. Um, with the um idea of reconnecting young people to education in the post pandemic in, environment um lego uh was interested in exploring um what that looks like and supporting that all over the world you know what are the grassroots doing you know through play to uh um yeah to help kids get reconnected and what can we what might we do uh, to drive more resources directly to them, but without you know the the networks and the on the ground knowledge of working with local organizations that we have, um, certainly a core interest of ours as well that we had independently kind of cooked up as a real priority for us, and then also having relationships, not potentially not yet funding relationships, but knowing the landscape around the world and knowing that there are these organizations out there, also using this approach. So it kind of naturally fits together. So we're not out there saying, hey, um, yeah, yeah, I know you're a grassroots organization and you're 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 working on a particular issue, but could you also do learning through play? Yeah, we're not doing that. You know, what we're doing is we're making sure that that alignment um, with the funders' goals and with the organization and with GFC already exists so that yes the the funding is bound you know it should be about learning through play with a certain age group um and if we find organizations that are authentically already working on that then that becomes less restrictive it doesn't push them in different directions it amplifies 
you know, the work that they're already hoping to do and hoping to do better and may not have the funding to do because they're busy with other projects over here to keep uh, keep the bills paid. Um, and so that's the that's the alignment that's essential to make sure that yes, the funding is flexible, but it is bound. But those boundaries are are you know are are boundaries within which those organizations have already decided to to work. I see. So it's about a very careful um, matching, if you will. Now, you mentioned to me before that Global Fund for Children, at least historically, has also done what you called imaginative media work, books, film, photography, etc., cetera, uh, children's stories. Some of this work you have um, not continued in the same uh, way, but dignified storytelling is still mm -hmm. important. How does that fit into your theory of change? Yeah, so a, a part of the original idea of Global Fund for Children was as a bit of a social enterprise that, you know, these uh, books that our founder, uh, Maya Ejmera, uh, wrote and, and co-wrote with uh, with various folks, um, really just, you know, charming books, um, you know, about and, and for, you know, young people um, kind of opening their eyes to the realities of uh, what it's like for for kids around the world. Um, and all the, you know, the challenges and the beauty <laughs> that go along with that. Um, at one point before my time, the decision was made to kind of discontinue publishing those books. Um, but there are many of them that are still in print and being revised. And we have a great relationship with the publishing company. And, you know, a, a modest amount of the, the revenue come, still comes to GFC to this day. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, you know, part of it was like telling those really authentic global stories to you know, um, not not showing all all the problems and how you know yeah children are, are hurt by all these things around the world although they are but really focusing on the power of the agency the resilience you know of of young people and and that's what we're really committed to doing in terms of dignified storytelling um it's yeah our communications are really rooted in the hypothesis that um, progress is happening, young people have power, and it's important to tell the stories of that power. Yes, they are not, not shying away from the difficult situations they're in, but in everything we do, you know, how we picture uh, the young people, the permissions we get, um, even camera angles, we're not looming over them you know, uh, you know and, and, and as if we have the power, but, you know, they're the strong ones and we're there to support. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, that is not always the best way to trigger someone to get. We've all seen television commercials and received direct mail that don't use that uh, right. dignified storytelling approach. Um, I am stubbornly dedicated to um whether it, it works for fundraising or not it's these stories of power of agency of change um where young people really are the change makers and the leaders um that need to be told mm -hmm. and um part of and that's you know part of our our theory of change is is that you know as the young people become leaders within these organizations they are much much more likely to be able to make those changes that they see need to happen in those their communities than than we are and so the sum total of that look you know that real really rooted brilliance and ingenuity and innovation and power is really what makes the the big difference in the world and it's important to articulate that I loved what you said. A progress is happening and young people have agency. Now you worked at Global Giving before. That organization in its own right, in my view, played an interesting, maybe I want to call it trend shaping role in civil society when it was founded. Tell us a little bit more about how you think Global Giving introduced innovation into the sector and what did you learn there that you brought into um, the Global Fund for Children. I'm I'm just curious. Maybe there's not much of an angle, but I <laughs> wanted to explore it. Well, it, it's funny because you know, for yeah, you know, since my Peace Corps days, I had various experiences where I was just really frustrated that 
you know, why are these amazing ideas from all these people that I've met so difficult to, you know, to, to fund or to get, you know, if it's not funding, get whatever other resources they need. Certainly, you know, someone who needs $2,000 to do an initial printing of a study guide um, for students in, you know, a particular country and to see if that would work, somebody would be willing to pay that $2,000 to give that yeah. idea a try. Um, and I had this, you know, idea in my head that, that you know, yeah, I, if I won the lottery or whatever, I would, you know, go around the world and like really figure out, okay, uh, you know, to the, the guy I met in Belize whose boat and flute had been washed away um, in a hurricane and was now out of work. Um, uh, somebody, somebody out there, I didn't have the resources at the time, but somebody would certainly help him get a boat and a flute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you could like communicate that need and that chain of trust. So yes, this is not, you know, just some random person trying to scam the world. This is actually like a real person who has a history, who has the potential to get their life back on track with just a little nudge here or there. But we now know that as crowdfunding. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and, but in 2005, when I, I joined uh, Global Giving, it was just this idea that, wait a minute, that's a brilliant idea. I, I've had that idea and I'm so happy that, uh, you know, somebody's actually trying it. I really should join that organization. That makes perfect sense. But it was actually pretty radical at the time. Yeah. You know, it, 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 you know the, the, the headline of early GSC days was it's the eBay of, of philanthropy. You know, mm -hmm. a better way to connect buyers and sellers of social impact. And, you know, crowdfunding was not a term, but that's indeed what we were building um, was a way to kind of turn the usual way things happen on its head to start with the ideas of the people you know closest to the challenge and to give them a platform, you know, to get those ideas funded uh, and, and tried. Um, and using a very tech forward approach, yeah. um, which we now know as crowdfunding. So, and, and, you know, global giving was, you know, you know, the first kind of, you know, global crowdfunding platform for nonprofits. Now there are a lot of options out there. Um, and yeah, so it was uh, a radical idea um, ahead of its time. And then the world kind of caught up. <laughs> And um, the growth that Global Giving has uh, experienced, I think, is some evidence that, you know, generally people are coming around to a different way of thinking that, well, what do I know about, you know, what's going to work for those people? You know, no, uh, let me be supportive of the, the great ideas that bubble up and some place, sometimes from you know, not the most of the time from not the usual suspects from right. you yes, know, really, the people on the margins. Right. So really citizen to citizen, peer to peer. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I thought was so lovely about global giving uh, when it opened the door. And I myself definitely also uh, give through them. Um, so let's talk a little bit about philanthropy as a, as a I don't really like the word system. It's so overused. Um, uh, but um, you have observations about philanthropy when it's done as, as a system. You said in the past it's colonial in mindset and in practice, and it reinforces systems of oppression. How do you see that uh, linked to what Global Fund for Children tries to do differently? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'll, I'll, yeah, and I say that and knowing that just about everybody in this system is operating in good faith with good intentions. Mm -hmm. um, but the sum total of that just has a tendency to perpetuate the system as it is um, because all the incentives are, you know, you know, have been and many continue to be aligned around what the donor is most interested in. And how can I make sure that the recipients of my money aren't perpetrating fraud on me. You know, what is my risk as a funder in funding you, nascent organization, you know, someplace else in the world? Um, and I think that compliance and upward accountability first mindset um, leads to all sorts of um, 
problematic practices where the incentives line up to say, sure, you want this work done, I will do that work and I will report back to you on the work that was done. And then maybe at some point we evaluate whether it worked or not, but it doesn't really matter because now we're on to the next thing. And you're kind of closing out the opportunity for real messy, complex, you know, systemic change, which has a tendency to kind of resist the more, you know, linear, you know, yeah, the more traditional linear expectations about how things work. I put in this money, you deliver this project, the project delivers this impact, and then we all um, celebrate and, and move on. Love now, it, yeah, which, yes, uh, everybody needs to have some idea of what am I trying to accomplish in the world? What are the things I need to in order to try the things I need to try in order to accomplish what I'm accomplishing? So I'm not saying that um, there's no space at all. I mean, we have a theory of change and um, and it helps to kind of organize your thoughts and your work and to describe how you think about that. And it's that level of sophisticated thinking that actually exists very naturally in many, many, many grassroots organizations around the world that, but not in a way that neatly ties up you know, into a log frame or, or, or theory of change in a way that's like perfectly recognizable to, um, many funders. So you have um so then that creates just blockages you don't have access you know to if you're a, an organization in particular in, in certain parts of the world to the funding that you need even though you are a tremendous organization with an extremely sophisticated approach great ways of sort of assessing your progress and impact but you're in rural nigeria and you know you there are biases against you because of where you happen to sit and um, that scares many donors off um, because they're worried about their money. And that's something we're trying to fix. Um, you know, we're trying to, you know, really start with, you know, the brilliant ideas, um, come up with like, okay, who's, who, what organizations do we know that are in this together, potentially in this together? And then who are the funders out there who can kind of buy into this idea that has authentically bubbled up? you know, from the communities themselves. And I, you know, it's, it's, it's taken to the extreme, you know, you have, again, with great intention, some of the excesses of, um, you yeah, know, the effective altruism way of thinking, like, okay, I have made all of this money, I want to do as much good as I possibly can with this money, again, great intention, noble idea. But then, Ultimately, if I really will have that lens on, you know, the best use of my money, there are only a very few organizations that are going to stand up to that. Well, if I can save a hundred lives for a hundred dollars, why would I not do that? Well, because not every effort that's going to save all of those lives can be wrapped up tidily in a randomized control trial. And so it, the danger is that way of thinking kind of crowds out um the more exploratory and more emergent you know kind of impact that that really happens you know taken to the absurd extreme you know if we spend all of you know the money hunting asteroids that may you know kill us all uh and we don't work on access to education you know maybe the girl in uganda who's the one who invented the way to detect the asteroid doesn't get her chance <laughs> and we get hit by the asteroid anyway yeah. Um, so you've got to have both approaches. There's room for for both. And but I think what we're trying to do is to, you know, stand up for long term system change that doesn't happen always in, in predictable ways uh, to stand up for uh, communities that you know determine the things that they want to work on and then assist them in ways that are uh, appropriate. I see. I see. And you also as an organization, wish to encourage homegrown domestic uh, philanthropy. Is that right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a. Um, I mean, I think what we're trying to do is to look at 
I mean, because communities have many, many, many assets that um, they don't always um, yeah, think of leveraging first. Um, and so we're, we're really looking at ways that um, we can work with organizations that help catalyze efforts within communities um, to really make the most of the assets that are already there and to really you know, gain strength on their own. And, and yes, certainly uh, I just visited a community in Sierra Leone that had worked very closely with one of our, our partners and yeah, they wanted to build a school. And the initial you know, assumption was, well, we need the government to come in and build the school. How can we do that? But then they eventually realized, well, shoot, we can just build it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they needed a little bit of money to you know, put the tin roof on the top, but everything else was locally sourced. And ultimately they got the you know, government approval to you know, run the school and the government's very supportive, but it was really the community doing it themselves, leveraging assets in ways that they hadn't initially thought of doing. Um, but through, you know, the you know, really, um, you know, dynamic and complex work with uh, a partner of ours in, in that area, um, they were able to do, you know, something pretty, pretty remarkable and are now thinking about, okay, what can we do next? Mm, interesting. So you uh, primarily work, uh, uh, let's say, on promoting and stimulating homegrown philanthropy within the setting of the work with partner organizations and uh, program participants, um, you're not so much working on, let's say, the infrastructure for homegrown philanthropy in countries or regions, is it? Not not so directly. Um, you know, I think you know, if you look, it, it, that's part of the work I was doing at, at, at Global Giving was trying to explore how you know, a global platform could complement local mechanisms for for local philanthropy, and those those ex exist and are 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 are, are powerful in, in some cases. In some yeah. cases, they've they've gone in pretty disempowering and exploitative directions. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think the practice of philanthropy, um, you know, is is not uniquely a north-south phenomenon nope. Not at all. Uh, people without a lot of resources percentage-wise tend to be more generous than people with a lot of resources absolutely um, and there are many local untapped resources for sure it's, it's so it's, it's work that we're doing we're supportive of but it, it, it's it's not like we are um yeah, kind of setting up mini global fund for childrens to to try try to do this in a bunch of places. Okay, I, I I just wanted to understand a little bit more. Now we also talked in the past about the work that you and your uh, teams had to do with your board to move towards a more trust based philanthropy, and that was of interest to me as well. Uh, what you said we needed to encourage our board friends to become more courageous. Tell us a little bit about the transition um, that the board, that you wanted the board to encourage to go through, how that went, where you are now, and what is still work to be done, if any. Mm -hmm. well, I think, uh, yeah, and I've been with the organization for uh, a little over five years now, and um, yeah, it's, it's just a very different in, environment uh, on the board. I think there were a lot of really very big questions we were wrestling with when I first arrived. And um, even around you know, some of the convert, some of the work that, you know, seems, you know, typical to us now was a, a little bit edgier at the time. Um, you know, we were, yeah, we were um, edging more into supporting uh, organizations that held you know, advocacy um, in various ways as you know part of their core mission, and and some folks on the board for for them, advocacy translated into, okay, are they going out and protesting, and is that a risk for us reputationally? Mm -hmm. When in reality, advocacy is, I mean, yes, it can be you know advocating in the political realm. It can also just be working in communities to change attitudes about various things. 
Yeah, um, it doesn't so, have to be contentious. It doesn't have to be contentious. Sometimes it is contentious. And yet, um, it doesn't have to be. And, and so kind of reaching an understanding that, well, it's a pretty typical trajectory within an organization to start off, okay, what can I do to alleviate this problem that's in front of me right now? And then at some stage to say, well, why do I keep dealing with this problem? What is wrong with the system that I need to change in order you know, to yeah, really solve this problem? And inevitably that uh, leads to you know, working with other organizations, maybe at the policy level, maybe there's the community change level, um, but it gets away from, wait a minute, I thought we were just delivering stuff to kids. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it never has been as simple as that. Um, but I think the, the board, you know, has has like really, really deepened its appreciation of um, how change really happens. Um, and we've gotten a lot more in sync. Um, you know, we used to operate kind of like a, a more traditional foundation where we would have a couple of big grant dockets a year and we would you know, ask the board to kind of approve them. Um, but when organizations have urgent needs and opportunities come, then you can't always wait, you know, up to six months for the next docket to come together. And then at that point, everything's kind of fully baked anyway. So yeah. if something goes wrong at that point and someone has a question, then you're kind of back at square one. So we all realized that we were locked into a system that didn't really work. So just moving away from the board approving two dockets a year to um, having a much more meaningful engagement on the overall kind of programmatic strategy from grant making to capacity development and looking at, you know, what the portfolio looks like in a very deep dive once a year and a mini dive another time uh, during the year um, has actually been a lot more engaging for the board because they're learning more about our approaches before, you know, everything is baked into a docket. And so there's more of an opportunity to shape you know, and, and to keep an eye on the work. Um, and it also creates a lot more flexibility you know, for us to be able to, you know, respond when, you know, you know, emergencies happen in the world, whether it's, you know, uh, COVID pandemic or the war in Ukraine, um, any of the floods in Pakistan or any of the other challenges that our, our partners uh, face and that we raise money for. So at the, um, at the one level, um, you've been able to, as an organization, to become more flexible and responsive. On the other hand, the board is actually more strategically uh, engaged than it was in the past when it was primarily rubber stamping mm -hmm. to what you call fully baked dockets. Yeah. And I think that's that's kind of a, a marker of a trust based approach. Um, the board being very informed, um, building that trust that they understand you know, where the, the staff is, is, is heading and where we are now, which um, is, is, is free because it's a, it, we've, we've built that trust, which then makes it a lot easier, you know, for us, you know, to be more flexible, you know, with our partners in terms of timing, in terms of when things happen. Um, and we can be lighter in, in terms of what we actually expect, you know, from them during application and reporting process, because we're not you know, always having to extract you know, information uh, to make sure we have every uh, line on the docket uh, filled mm -hmm. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, did this also generate new perspectives on who Global Fund for Children needed to have on the board? Yeah, I think, you know, from the start, the, the board was pretty conscious that, you know, we needed to you know, add different perspectives, um, you know, and it's, it's in, an, in my mind, I, it's because we are an organization that raises funds. Um, we have to have a good mix of people who are, you know, really deeply um, understanding of our particular role in the ecosystem and really understand our, our work at a deep level. We also have to have people who um have links into uh financing um you know the work we do because it doesn't doesn't happen if we don't you know have money coming through and and to really have um uh and i think that's really enriched the, the board conversations um because everyone's getting smarter together um 
Mm. You know, we've we've asked uh, we have an alumni partner of ours, uh, Maya uh, from Serbia, who's now on our board. You know, we're about to um, welcome ex officio uh, chair of our youth leadership council uh, to the board, um, and we've carved out a uh, budget to welcome um, other uh, leaders. Um, from the global south areas of the world where we don't have great representation on our board to be able to participate and make a trip um, at least once a year to join a board meeting in person. So we're being really um, conscious of just making sure that we have as many perspectives as we can, which is, yeah, a lot. I mean, it's just more interesting and more fun for everybody. <laughs> and and it, it happens to be more effective as well. Uh, tell me more about more fun. I'm curious what you mean by that. Well, we, we're we're able to have just more meaningful conversations about. Yeah, you know, we last last year we were in the cycle of um, kind of creating a five year vision you know, for GFC, and having different perspectives on that vision uh, was 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 great. Um, and I think you know our board members are all extremely intellectually curious um, about the work we do. And it's actually difficult um, to like really directly connect because so much of the work we do is not in Washington, DC or, or New York. You know, actually a lot of it is in London and, and the UK at this point, but it's, it's, it's hard, you know, it's not like we're a, a food bank where you can go and stock shelves. Um, and so to kind of make it more real for folks and to provide that, um, that, yeah, that nuanced perspective of the work we do. I, the feedback so far, uh, in, in recent years has been, wow, the information we're getting is, is, is meaningful. It's at the right level. And we're having better conversations about how we, you know, how we steer the organization. I see. I see. And, and, um, you've talked about how the work with the board, um, the evolution that the board was willing to go through, uh, changing the composition of board, that all um, shaped and changed to some extent board culture, if you will. How about the culture uh, in the rest of the organization? Um, you know, many of us are rhetorically entirely on board with what you're describing as kind of broad mm -hmm. kind of paradigm shifts. But when the river hits the road and when it affects our own roles in the organization, our jobs, our futures, et cetera, our decision-making rights, et cetera, et cetera, it can get more, um, the, the, the picture gets more blurry. Can you tell us a little bit about from a culture shaping perspective, this journey, what did that mean for staff and for you and your relationship with staff and so on? Yeah, our staff composition has changed dramatically um, over the past five years. So yeah, we've gone from uh, a, head, a very, very much a Washington DC headquarters mentality and a satellite team in the UK and a couple of people around the world to, um, you know, 60 people in 20 countries uh, or, or, you know, or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, and that is really amazing um, and also challenging to make sure that everybody is, you know, supported and compensated equitably and have good yeah. onboarding processes uh, to make sure everyone is is really aligned you know with you know with the vision you know, with our plans um, and so it's a it's great challenges to have um, and, and we're, we're we're frankly catching up to ourselves a little bit in some of those respects mm -hmm. um, but the the staff, composition um, now uh, more accurately reflects the way we uh, want to work in the world and how we want to be perceived by our, our grantee partners around the world, which is the most important thing. Um, and the feedback from our partners has been really, really good as we've been making these changes. Um, as CEO of, of the organization, thinking about 
you know, HR compliance in 20 countries <laughs> and making sure everybody is, yeah, uh, like a global, uh, globally uh, uh, and equitably compensated you know, with respect to different markets, but not taking the different markets as they are because the markets are as they are because of the system that we're pushing against. Um, those are really, um, in some ways, incredibly like privileged problems to be able to work through. Um, but uh, if we're going to succeed and truly live up to our vision and values, those are some of the internal things that we've we've taken on and, and are tackling. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, all very um, complex within them. But for lack of time, let me move on. If I, if you and I now towards the end of our interview can zoom out a little bit. If you think about how the whole discourse in the sector um, around decolonizing aid, anti-racism, DI, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, what do you see not just for Global Fund for Children, but also for other organizations in the sector? What are still appropriate roles for Global North founded NGOs, both those that are more of a foundation type like yours, as well as those that have other that do other categories of work, if mm -hmm. you will? Yeah, I mean, I'm a I'm a pragmatist, so I'm realizing that for some period of time, we're going to be working largely within the system as it is. And so if GFC can shape that system and drive more resources more equitably uh, to more locally, uh, yeah, to more local leadership and all the different shapes and forms that that takes. I'll I'll, I'll take that uh, for now because the alternative is that it doesn't, and we may as well work on that in the moment. And yet, um, it's still within the system that we ultimately all want to disrupt. So we've gotten to do a few things that um, point in, in dramatically different directions. Um, so the team now is, is dreaming up some uh, experiments, um, some ideas that we would undertake um, in you know, particular communities in the world where we have particularly strong relationships um, that might point in dramatically different directions. Um, such, as? such as what does it really look like to be 100% community driven, where we're really, really, really not making any decisions, just catalyzing a process. And maybe there's actually no money involved. <laughs> there's no there's no project, there's no like, like flexible funding, there's just work that we're doing you know, together, uh, and yes, adding perspective that we've, you know, gathered from around the world, but you know, who is with us and dreaming up some fundamentally different thing, which I cannot yet articulate what that looks like, because that would be my idea. Um, but what, what do we need to do to like really, really explore that? We made good, good moves in that direction through, you know, very participatory grant making mechanisms involving you and taking ourselves out of decision making at every opportunity. And those are all good learning processes for us pointing in um, really interesting directions. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I think there's something else out there. And I don't know what that looks like yet, but I'm looking forward to exploring that with some other uh, intrepid uh, uh, you know, peers. Interesting. Yes, I'm sure that others will be watching to see what um, Global Fund for Children as um, you, you clearly are are trying to be at the front of the pack in terms of or a little bit of a vanguard role in terms of your corner of of philanthropy. So so I, I admire that. John, if people want to know more about you and about the Global Fund for Children and these directions that you're trying to shape, right? These sector uh, shaping roles that you're trying to, to play, where should they go? Yeah, I would suggest the, the blog area uh, at uh, globalfundforchildren.org. 
Um, there is a lot of great uh, learning material. Some of the research that we've done, you know, things that we're trying, stories of amazing stories of our partners, stories about the team. So a lot of great stuff in the that blog section um, that you might okay. not uh, otherwise gravitate toward. Um, and with with me, LinkedIn uh, is is the best way. Just look me up there. Uh, and if you want to connect, uh, make sure you uh, just say you uh, viewed the podcast. Listen, listen to view to view the podcast. Okay, we will definitely put that in the show notes. So with that, John, thank you for all those insights. Um, you've given me new food for thought. And thank you, listeners. If you found this podcast stimulating, then be sure to check out other episodes in the podcast. You can find uh, several episodes on efforts to shift roles for Global North founded NGOs that we just talked about, shift power, localized development. For instance, let me point you to episode 22 with Dorothy Miambi at MIDA. Uh, and my colleague um, Esther Quaco and myself have also undertaken recently a small qualitative benchmarking study for 17 civil society organizations who are a member of the International Civil Society Center on the extent to which they are, have already shifted power and what their next steps on their horizon uh, are or uh, perhaps should be. Uh, you can provide a link uh, or we will provide a link to the summary of that report in the show notes as well. All of this you can find on my website, fiveoaksconsulting.org with the number five and on the YouTube channel. Subscribe to the email list and you'll always be the first to know. So with that, I look forward to talking with you again next time on NGO Soul and Strategy.